chapter 43. Hope it's a good one. They've been getting better and better, I think. What y'all think? Elizabeth, as they drove along, watched for the first appearance of Pemberley Woods with some perturbation. <laughs> I've heard it being perturbed, but I haven't heard perturbation. And when at length they turned in at the lodge, her spirits were in a high flutter. The park was very large and contained great variety of ground. They entered it on one of its lowest points and drove for some time through a beautiful wood stretching over a wide extent. Elizabeth's mind was too full for conversation, but she saw and admired every remarkable spot and point of view. They gradually ascended for half a mile, then found themselves at the top of a considerable eminence where the wood ceased and the eye was instantly caught by Pemberley House. Situated on the opposite side of a valley into which the road with some abruptness wound, it was a large, handsome stone building standing well on rising ground and backed up by a ridge of high woody hills, and in front a stream of some natural importance was swelled into greater, but without any artificial appearance. Its banks were neither formal nor falsely adorned. Elizabeth was delighted. She'd never seen a place for which nature had done more, or where natural beauty had been so nice, <clears throat> had been so little, counteracted by an awkward taste. They were all of them warm in their admiration, and at that moment she felt that to be mistress of Pemberley might be something. I can just see that, can't you? Must have been something. They descended the hill, crossed the bridge, and drove to the door, and while examining the near aspect of the house, all her apprehension of meeting its owner returned. She dreaded lest the chambermaid had been mistaken. On applying to see the place, they were admitted into the hall, and Elizabeth, as they waited for the housekeeper, had leisure to wonder at her being where she was. The housekeeper came, a respectable-looking elderly woman, much less fine and more civil than she had any notion of finding her. They followed her into the dining parlor. It was a large, well-proportioned room, handsomely fitted up. Elizabeth, after slightly surveying it, went to a window to enjoy its prospect, the hill, crowded, crowned with wood which they had descended, receiving, receiving increased abruptness from the distance, was a beautiful object. Every disposition of the ground was good, and she looked on the whole scene, the river, the trees scattered on its banks, and the winding of the valley, as far as she could trace it with delight. As they passed into other rooms, these objects were taking different positions, but from every window there were beauties to be seen. The rooms were lofty and handsome, and their furniture suitable to be to the fortune of its proprietor, but Elizabeth saw with admiration of his taste that it was neither gaudy nor uselessly fine, and less of splendor and more real elegance than the furniture of Rosings. And of this place, thought she, I might have been mistress. With these rooms, I might now have been fam familiarly acquainted. Instead of viewing them as a stranger, I might have rejoiced in them as my own and welcomed to them as visitors, my uncle and aunt. But no, recollecting herself, that could never be. My uncle and aunt would have been lost to me. I should not have been, I should not have been allowed to invite them. This was a lucky recollection. It saved her from something very like regret. She longed to inquire of the housekeeper whether her master was really absent, but had not the courage for it. At length, however, the question was asked by her uncle, and she turned away and she turned away with alarm, while Mrs. Reynolds replied that he was, adding, but we expect him tomorrow with a large party of friends. How rejoiced was Elizabeth that their own journey had not been any circumstance, had not by any circumstance been delayed a day. 
Her aunt now called her to look at a picture. She approached and saw the likeness of Mr. Wickham suspended almost se amongst several other miniatures over the mantelpiece. Her aunt asked her smilingly how she liked it. The housekeeper came forward and told them that it was a picture of a young gentleman, the son of her late master, Stewart, who had been brought up by him at his own expense. He has now gone into the army, she added, but I'm afraid he has turned out very wild. Mrs. Gardner looked at her niece with a smile, but Elizabeth could not return it. And that, said Mrs. Reynolds, pointing to another of the miniatures, is my master, and very like him. It was drawn at the same time as the other about eight years ago. I have heard much of your master's fine person, added Mrs. Gardner, looking at the picture. It's a handsome face, but Lizzie, you can tell us whether it is like or not. Mrs. Reynolds' respect for Elizabeth seemed to increase on this intimidation of her knowing her master. Intimation, not intimidation. Int intimation. Intimation. Does that young lady know Mrs. Mr. Darcy? Elizabeth colored and said, a little. And do you not think him a very handsome gentleman, ma'am? Yes, very handsome. I'm sure I know none so handsome, but in the gallery upstairs you will see a finer, larger picture of him than this. This room was my late master's favorite room, and these miniatures are just as they used to be. Then, he was very fond of them. This accounted to Elizabeth for Mr. Wickham's being among them. Mrs. Reynolds then directed their attention to one of Miss, Miss Darcy, drawn when she was only about eight years old. And is Miss Darcy as handsome as her brother, said Mrs. Said Mrs. Gardner. Oh, yes, the handsomest young lady that ever was seen and so accomplished. She plays and sings all day long, and the next room is a new instrument. Just come down for her a present from my master. She comes here tomorrow with him. Mr. Gardner, whose manners were very easy and pleasant, pleasant encouraged her communica communicativeness by his questions and answers answers mrs reynolds either by pride or attachment had evidently great pleasure in talking of her master and his sister is your master much at pemberley in the course of the year not so much as i could wish sir but i dare say he may spend half his time here and Miss Darcy is always down for the summer months, except, thought Elizabeth, when she goes to Ramsgate. If your master would marry, you might see more of him. Yes, sir, I do not know when that will be. I do not know who is good enough for him. <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Gardner smiled. Elizabeth could not help saying, It's very much to his credit, I'm sure, that you should think so. <laughs> Dig. I say no more than the truth, and everybody will say that knows him, replied the other. Elizabeth thought that was this was going pretty far. And she listened with increasing astonishment as the housekeeper added, I've never known a crossword from him in my life, and I have known him ever since he was four years old. This was praise of all others most extraordinary, most opposite to her ideas. That he was not a good-tempered man had been her firmest opinion. Her keenest attention was awakened. She longed to hear more, and was grateful to her uncle for saying, There are very few people of whom so much can be said. You are lucky in having such a master. Yes, sir, I know I am. If I were to go through the world, I could not meet with the better. But I have always observed that they who are good-natured when children are good-natured when they grow up. And he was always the sweetest-tempered, most generous-hearted boy in the world. Elizabeth almost stared at her. Can this be Mr. Darcy, thought she? His father was an excellent man, said Mrs. Gardner. Yes, ma'am, that he was indeed, and his son will be just like him, just as affable to the poor. Elizabeth turned 
listened, wondered, doubted, and was impatient for more. Mrs. Reynolds could interest her on no other point. She related the subjects of the pictures, the dimensions of the rooms, and the price of the furniture in vain. Mrs. Gardner, highly amused by the kind of family prejudice to which he attributed her excessive commendation of her master, soon led again to the subject, and she dwelt with energy on his many merits as they proceeded together up the great staircase. It's the best, he is the best landlord and the best master, said she, that ever lived. Not like the wild young men nowadays who think of nothing but themselves. There is not one of his tenants or servants but will give him a good name. Some people call him proud, but I am sure I never saw anything of it. To my fancy, it's only because he does not rattle away like other young men. In what an amiable light does this place him, thought Elizabeth. This fine account of him, whispered her aunt as they w walked, is not quite consistent with his behavior to our poor friend. Perhaps we might, we might be deceived. That's not very likely. Our authority has, our authority was too good. On reaching the spacious lobby above, they were shown into a very pretty sitting room, lately fitted up with a greater elegance and lightness and lightness from the apartments below, and they and were informed that it was but just done to give pleasure to Miss Darcy, who had taken a liking to the room when last at Pemberley. He certainly, he is certainly a good brother, said Elizabeth as she walked towards one of the windows. Mrs. Reynolds anticipated Miss Darcy's delight when she should enter the room, and this is always the way with him, she added. Whatever can give his sister any pleasure is sure to be done in a moment. There is nothing he would not do for her. The picture gallery and two or three of the principal bedrooms were all that remained to be shown. In the former were many good paintings, but Elizabeth knew nothing of the art. And from such... Oops, art. And from such as had been already visible below... She had willingly turned to look at some drawings of Miss Darcy's in crayons, whose subjects were usually more interesting and also more intelligible. In the gallery, there were many family portraits, but they could have... You know what, guys? I'm going to stop there because I'm getting so sleepy. So sleepy. Yeah, I'm going to stop right there. Sorry about that. I know it's just a little, about 13 minutes. And I stopped into 12, but I can tell the lines are starting to go together. And I went to bed late, late, late again last night, but I slept in this morning, so I got sleep. Okay, darlings. Again, I hope to see you live at 5. If you think about it, Google some happenings from 1959 um, today and tomorrow, or I don't know about today, but tomorrow for sure, I wanted to look up some things that happened in 1959 besides my being born on March 21st. See ya! Love you lots! Mwah. Be sweet! Don't be ugly. See you soon. Hope. Hope I hope.